Good, Good afternoon, afternoon everybody. everybody. I hope that uh, you're, you're watching, watching this public lecture, lecture which is part of the procedure to uh, apply for tenure at uh, Vitautas Magnus uh, University uh, as a full-time professor. So um, we had some technical uh, difficulties with the introduction uh, and that's why I started myself. The date of my public lecture is not chosen by coincidence. Today, 100 years ago, Andrei Dmitri Sakharov was born. It was a weird time. Uh, you have to imagine 1921, the civil war in what was the Russian Imperium, now the Soviet Union, was coming to an end. Millions of people perished, either because of hunger or because they had been killed as enemies of the people. The Soviets, who were now in full control of the country, understood that they had to soften restrictions and so the new economic policy was unleashed, allowing small private enterprises uh, to develop. And in a way it was quite similar to Deng Xiaoping's Daike Kaifang in China, which in turn was very similar to Gorbachev's Glasnost and Perestroika in the Soviet Union. But like in China, this liberalization eventually resulted in a period of repression and the elimination of anything that could threaten the greatness of the Soviet nation. So the environment in which Sakharov grew up and developed is one that is maybe now hard to understand. Revolutionary zeal, killing without a seeming reason, but also an explosion of art and culture, which in turn all fell victim in the same revolutionary destruction, but eventually propelled him into becoming one of the great personalities of the 20th century. Stemming from a highly intellectual Moscow family, by the way, with some Lithuanian roots, the combination of, this, of his intellectual genius and upbringing led to him becoming one of the key persons in developing the Soviet nuclear deterrence. Yet at the same time, this same combination made him the most proponent voice of nuclear armament, disarmament and proliferation, much to the chagrin of the Soviet leadership and eventually turned him into one of the moral leaders of the 20th century. And I'm convinced of today as well. Sakharov Im uh, Sakharov's image and stance is, I believe, timeless and is a symbol to us all. When I entered my field of work, which is best described as a crossover between human rights and mental health, but with a special interest in the post-Soviet region, Sakharov was for me a permanent example. In Soviet times, any substantial writing should have at least one quote of Lenin, but with him it was quite different. Reference to Sakharov was not based on some kind of iconic imagination, but on the pure fact that he did what we all hoped we would be able to accomplish, to take our social responsibility and accept the consequences. Sakharov was in that sense the opposite of Lenin. He was not a populist, he had no political ambition, and he did not want to impose anything on other people. All he wanted and all he did was to stand for his beliefs and was willing to pay the price for doing so. In a different way, but with the same determination, or maybe better put, inevitability, also to date, uh, almost to the date 49 years ago, not far from here in Kaunas, the young student Romas Kalanta put himself on fire. The Soviets had a huge problem. His act of protest against the Lithu uh, occupation of Len uh, Le uh, Lithuania that cost him his life resulted in massive demonstrations with the risk of spilling over to other cities in the country. In order to quell the unrest, Kaunas was sealed off from the rest of the country and a group of psychiatrists was convened and given a task to find an explanation for Kalanta's gruesome act. They found it in his diary where he wrote that he dreamed that one day Lithuania would be free. This was a clear act of insanity. Who could have such an, Im uh, uh, such an imaginable and dangerous thought? It was a clear sign of sluggish schizophrenia and thus he was posthumously declared mentally ill. The names of the psychiatrists who signed the diagnosis are well known. And while some might have signed under KGB pressure, knowing that this was utter nonsense, I do not exclude the possibility that some of them actually might have thought that only a mentally ill person could have chosen such a painful death for something that
that was then considered to be not more than a Fata Morgana. I became involved in Soviet psychiatry 44 years ago, when at a rather young age, I became interested in the plight of political prisoners in the Soviet Union and decided to concentrate on those who were sent to psychiatric hospital because of their political views or believe in God. I had no understanding of psychiatry, knew very little of life in the Soviet Union, and my only knowledge was based on books by Alexander Solzhenitsyn and materials published by uh, Amnesty International. It was the former political prisoner Vladimir Bukowski who fundamentally changed the course of my life by becoming my mentor and setting me on the course of where I am today. He decided that I should become a Moscow correspondent after my studies so I could smuggle documents and writings to the West and thus function as a sort of mailbox of the dissident movement. The campaign to eradicate the dissident movement, started by KGB Chairman Yuri Andropov in 1979 in preparation of the 1980 Moscow Olympics. They mess this messed up completely my plans. And in early 1980, I decided not to wait and booked my first trip to the Soviet Union to meet dissidents and offer my help. Loaded with vitamins, medicine, warm clothes, thermo underwear, as well as bulb points and lighters that could be used to bribe prison guards, I traveled in the early spring of 1980 twice to Leningrad and Moscow, where I met dissidents and families of political prisoners. Most of the people I met were arrested soon after, including the Estonian dissident Martin Niklus, who had come to Moscow to deliver a letter to the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet, in which he demanded the annulment of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. We met twice, before and after delivering the letter, and on the way back to Tartu, he was arrested and subsequently sentenced to 15 years. 10 years of camp, five years of exile. I was in shock and I decided that I could not deliver a normal, develop a normal career as long as he was behind bars. He was released only under Gorbachev in 1988 and by that time I was already so much engaged that a normal career was for me almost unimaginable. Of course, looking back, I was frightfully romantic and had very little understanding of what I got myself into. I didn't realize it then, at least consciously, but now I understand that the strong trigger was the story of my uncle, who joined the Dutch resistance at the age of 23, right at the beginning of the war. He, was very, he very much loved his hometown, Rotterdam, which was then very beautiful and quite similar to Amsterdam, but was bombed away by the German Luftwaffe on May 14, 1940, in order to force the country to surrender. He was so angry that he decided to join the resistance, of course also not knowing what he got himself into. The resistance during the first two years was very amateurish and made lots of mistakes, which resulted in many arrests. The Germans responded ruthlessly, torturing the prisoners and subsequent, uh, subsequently putting them up against the wall. And gradually the resistance started to understand that this was not some sort of game, but a struggle for life or death. My uncle was almost arrested in 1942, changed his identity twice, but was eventually arrested in October 1943 and sent to the notorious prison in Scheveningen that now houses prisoners like the Serb war criminals Mladic and Karadzic. He was to be executed, but his father managed to buy his life with 22 bottles of whiskey, and instead he was sent to the camps. His odyssey through seven camps ended in a camp in the Hartz Mountains near the Czech border, where he managed to escape. However, he was too emaciated and too ill, and at the age of 28, he passed away two weeks after he saw American troops passing by. My whole youth was tainted by war, and war was on the agenda basically every day. My father read endless amounts of books about the war and then passed them on to me. And so when he started reading the three volumes of uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago in 1974, he also passed them on to me, and that triggered my interest in Soviet dissidents and political prisoners. I'm sure my uncle must have been scared time and again when falsifying documents, 
helping British pilots to get to Portugal from where they returned to England, or when finding refuge for Jewish children in order to keep them out of the hands of the Nazis. But he did this because he felt he had to do it, because it was the only right thing to do. His father was very frightened, but his mother quite fearless, and when she was arrested by the SS and taken hostage, she made the SS officer carry her suitcase to the prison van. I'm sure she was instrumental in him making his choice that determined the course of his far too short life, just like my mother did with me, pumping me from the very early age Christian values into my head. When in the 1980s I asked whether I should try to make my uncle a righteous among nations and get a tree in his name at Yad Vashem, she said, no, no, no way. He did what he is supposed to do. No need to honor that. So when I started my work as a career to the dissident movement in the Soviet Union, I did actually exactly what my mother had taught me, even though I was terribly scared. I will never forget the fear during flights to Leningrad and Moscow, sitting on a plane, knowing that I had to smuggle large quantities of humanitarian aid into the country, then collect documents and some is that during my stay there, and then see how I could smuggle it all out on the way back. The relief of arriving back in Amsterdam was tempered by all the worries about my newfound friends in Moscow, many of whom eventually disappeared in the Gulag, and by the knowledge that three months later I would be back on the plane again for the next round as a career. My image of the dissidents then was one of heroes, fearless people who went against an omnipowerful state, who risked everything because of their ideals and beliefs. Indeed, they seemed considered, they seemed to have a special mindset, the one that Soviet psychiatry considered to be a mental illness, a form of sluggish schizophrenia. But gradually I also started to see their weak sides, their sometimes impossible characters that would have made them dissident in any society. But I also got to see their fears and anxieties and realized that they were in many ways not so different, just felt that what they had to do, they did, irrespective of the consequences. In 1988, I met in Moscow a dissident who eventually became one of my best friends, the Ukrainian psychiatrist Semyon Gluzman. He was for me a hero, his image engraved in my head, his biography recorded in my memory in all minuscule detail. Gluzman had, at the age of 24, been what you now call a early uh, career psychiatrist, but decided that the famous Moscow dissident, General Pyotr Grigorenko, had been incarcerated in a special psychiatric hospital for purely political reasons and was in fact of a sound mind. He wrote a report, a Diagnosis in Absentia, which soon wound up on the desk of the KGB in Moscow. Quickly, the author was identified and Gluzman was picked up and sentenced to seven years camp and three years in exile. Basically, his whole youth was taken away and the 10 years of imprisonment changed his life fundamentally. His memoirs, published several years ago, are a fantastic read because not only did he meet prisoners who had been in the camps already since the 1950s, including some Lithuanian forest brothers, but also because he very honestly writes about his fears and his anxieties and the way he managed to keep his head up and remain morally intact. The 10 years in camp were the best in his life, he wrote, because he was totally free and in the company of the brightest and most honest and moral members of the intelligentsia. In a way, he felt sorry for the guards because they had to climb down from the watchtower at the end of the day and live in the Soviet Union, while Gluzman and his fellow prisoners had their own free haven. Of course, life was harsh and difficult, and the many hunger strikes he held out of protest against the conditions severely affected his physical health, but mentally he was stronger than ever, and the years in the camp were maybe the best possible school to learn to stand by your own convictions and not succumb to pressure by the authorities. At that time, in the 1980s, things were for me very much black and white, with dissidents of course being white and heroic and the authorities being black and objectionable. In the course of time, I started to th see things 
more sophisticatedly, more realistically. And I saw how some of the dissidents had actually quite uh, unpleasant uh, convictions or characters and how some people within the system were seriously trying to do a good job and sometimes even try to bring on change from within. One of those is another good friend, Andrei Kovalyov, whose father led the Soviet delegation to the negotiations that led to the signing of the Helsinki Accords in 1975. He later became Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs under Eduard Shevanadze. Andrei himself, uh, as a young diplomat, worked in the Department of Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs and was actively helping to bring about an end to the systematic abuse of psychiatry for pur uh, political purposes. And very much to the anger of both the KGB and the Ministry of Health, who did not want to lose this tool of repression, it was eventually his boss, Eduard Shevanadze, who demanded at the Politburo that the psychiatric abuse should stop. It was Samuel Glusman, whom I mentioned earlier, who helped me to see things in a different light, more holistically, you could say, more three-dimensionally, whatever way you want to uh, call it. His way of dealing with the trauma of 10 years incarceration was to get as close as possible to his former enemy and to befriend some of those who had been on the other side of the barricades. He became friends with the deputy director of the Ukrainian Secret Service, SBU, Volodymyr Pristaiko, and through Glusman, I also became acquainted with him. Pristaiko came from a poor peasant family, grew up without a father, and the chance of entering the KGB school was for him the opportunity of a lifetime. He had a legal education, but also was an amateur historian, and having unlimited access to the KGB files, of course, uh, in, uh, in Kiev, he started publishing articles and documents on the annihilation of the Ukrainian intelligentsia in the 1930s and the Holodomor of 1932-1933 that killed at least 7 million Ukrainian peasants. Bristanko was a nice and intelligent man who tried to do his best to give Ukraine back part of his hidden brutal history without touching the history of the times, of course, when he was an active KGB officer himself. He always maintained that he had nothing to do with dissident cases, but one time when he tried to clear his conscience a bit by alleging that he had something to do with them, Glusman immediately stopped him and told him that he didn't want to know, because then they could no longer be friends. There is a beautiful documentary made in the mid-1990s by the Dutch-Russian documentary maker, a double interview with Glusman and Pristaiko. Aljona van der Horst is her name. So in one scene, Glusman comes to the headquarters of the SBU, the first time since his arrest in 1971, and he goes to Pristaiko's cabinet. On the table is a carton box that contains his personal KGB file. It's yours, Pristaiko says, and invites Glusman to take it. But the latter doesn't want for the simple reason that he doesn't want to know who gave evidence against him. It is too painful and with unforeseen destructive consequences. Better not to know and accept that some people were not strong enough to withstand the pressure of the KGB. Coming back to the political abuse of psychiatry in the Soviet Union, of course, in the 1980s, I was convinced that all psychiatrists who had been or were involved were little versions of Mengele, or the Nazi doctors who performed experiments on prisoners in concentration camps. When I had my first meeting with the board of the newly founded Ukrainian Psychiatric Association that Glusman had set up in the beginning of 1991, I was convinced that I was confronted with representatives of Soviet abuse of psychiatry who probably themselves had been engaged in locking up dissidents. They, on their part, were probably convinced that I was a CIA agent and it took quite a while before we started to trust each other and eventually developed friendly relationships. One of the psychiatrists in Kiev volunteered to run the complaints office of the Ukrainian Psychiatric Association, as it turned out because she had been involved in the case of the Ukrainian dissident Oksana Meshko, whose Soviet authorities tried to have declared mentally ill. And so this was her way of paying back to society for what she felt that she had done wrong. Her office processed, in the course of time, more than 20,000 complaints 
And this archive is now in the holdings of the Andrei Sakharov Research Center here at Vitautas Magnus University. Since the late 1980s, I've been involved in supporting reformers in psychiatry in the region. We started out with a very small group. So Semyon Glusman, then the Moscow-based lawyer Svetlana Pulubinskaya, and Professor Yuri Nuller in St. Petersburg, the son of a high-ranking Soviet diplomat who in 1938 was recalled from his post in Paris and was shot in the cellars of the KGB headquarters in Leningrad. Nuller himself was arrested after the war, accused of having been recruited by the French Secret Service at the age of three and survived eventually nine years in Kalima. Gradually, this group became larger and larger, involving more and more countries, and by the mid-1990s, the organization I was then in charge of, the Global Initiative on Psychiatry, ran a network of over a thousand reformers in 23 countries in the region. During the many meetings we organized, we became friends, and of course, we also discussed the Soviet times. And what I started to realize was that many sincerely believed that dissidents were mentally ill for several reasons. First of all, they had no contact with world psychiatry and were trained according to the dogmas of the Moscow School of Psychiatry and had no reason to doubt the validity of these dogmas. But also because they could not imagine how a person could go against such a powerful state as the Soviet Union with a party that had, uh, uh, had established absolute control through a reign of terror. How could one be of a sound mind and accept that one could lose a job and maybe one's family or that your children would be kicked out of the university. Surely, in that case, you had lost all sense of reality and overvalued one's own importance. One of the psychiatrists we worked with had been director of a psychiatric hospital in Ukraine, but also the local party organizer. And when the first documents were sent from the first party congress after Mikhail Gorbachev had been elected general secretary of the Communist Party, she was in utter shock because to her, these papers clearly showed uh, that he had uh, mental illness and was suffering from what Soviet psychiatry called sluggish schizophrenia. Sluggish schizophrenia was the diagnosis that most dissidents were given. It uh, was a very serious illness that neither the person himself nor his surroundings could uh, correctly understand, but which required immediate hospitalization. And symptoms were struggle for the truth, perseverance, reform ideas, exactly those symptoms that Gorbachev rather quickly started to show. Her views of him only changed after Ukraine became independent and gradually contact was established with world psychiatry. Then it became clear to what extent Soviet psychiatry had separated itself from psychiatry that was practiced in the rest of the world. In preparation of my teaching here in Kaunas, I wrote a dissertation on the issue of Soviet political abuse of psychiatry and how this had affected the World Psychiatric Association, the main body representing psychiatrists from across the globe. During the period 1984-1989, the vice president of the association had been from East Germany and, as I found out during my research, actually had been an informal agent of the East German Stasi, the Secret Service. We had met once while he was in office in 1988 during a conference in Washington, but at that meeting, it, this meeting lasted only about 20 seconds. And he later explained to me that he had been frightened and was out of the way as quickly as possible because he was afraid that if there would be a photo taken of the two of us, he might lose his possibility to travel. Now we started to meet on a regular basis usually in hotel rooms, so he could speak freely, and step by step, we developed a trustful relationship that eventually developed into a friendship. Jochen Neumann was a very humble and intelligent person who had joined the communist youth organization FDJ as an adolescent because he was seeking a safe home. His father had been a petty fascist and spent several years in the Bautzen prison and came back as a completely broken man. Jochen considered himself to be a communist, but was in fact more a kind of 19th century bourgeois, as he put it himself. And his communism was still that of a romantic kid who seeked safety somewhere. 
He worked for the Stasi because he felt he needed to defend his country against the capitalist West. Yet in his reporting, he became so anti-Soviet and so pro-American that the East G German leadership even discussed whether he should still be allowed to go abroad because he seemed totally untrustworthy. In fact, from the very first moment, he refused to spy on people because he felt that this was a dirty work. And for two and a half years, he himself was under Stasi surveillance. However, among his close friends were some high-ranking officials, all Stasi agents themselves, who protected him, and thus he was able to meander through this minefield. He turned out to be a very ethical man, and in some ways, I think, even more ethical than many of the Western psychiatrists that I had met, and with whom I campaigned against the political abuse of psychiatry in the Soviet Union. I found proof of his story in the Stasi archives in Berlin, which I was allowed to read, but he was not, because he had been a Stasi agent. So during lunch breaks, we would sit in a restaurant, and I would tell him what I found in his personal file. The collapse of the DDR in 1989 had left Jochen a completely broken man. He lost his family, he lost his profession, and eventually emigrated to Saudi Arabia to work as a psychiatrist for one of the sheikhs. His diary has one predominant theme, suicide. His life had lost all meaning, and every entry in the diary is focused on whether he should end it all or not. The worst came when the sheikh, impressed by Jochen's hardworking attitude, praised him and added, you, you are so efficient, you are like, you are like Hitler. Befriending a former adversary and seeing history through his eyes very much helped my deeper understanding that black and white does not exist and that it is in fact a matter of shades of gray, you could say. As a result, I also revisited my university years in Amsterdam when one of my professors was actively engaged in changing the narrative of the Second World War. In his public lecture as professor at the University of Amsterdam in 1983, titled Under the Spell of Right and Wrong, he challenged the notion that except for a small group of collaborators, most of the Dutch had been right or good, and all the Germans had been wrong or bad. The older generation of historians fulminated against this. He challenged all the holy houses and triggered an at times furious debate but it resulted in revisiting the behavior of the Dutch during the Second World War, which turned out to be far less heroic than it had been presented. The overwhelming majority of the Dutch had actually been very complacent, and collaboration with the occupying Nazis had been much stronger than hitherto exposed. I used the avalanche of literature that had been produced on this in my book Undigested Past, The Holocaust in Lithuania, that was published in 2011, and com I compared in this book what happened here in Lithuania with what had happened in the Netherlands. In both cases, the overwhelming majority of the Jewish compatriots were killed during the Holocaust, with the main difference being the fact that here they were killed in the country itself, with active participation of Lithuanian police battalions, while the Dutch put them on the train to the extermination camps and let the others do the killing but the end result was actually the same. The Dutch police, the railway company, the civil servants, all took part in this horrific uh, killing spree and all washed their hands in innocence afterwards. And still now books are published on a regular basis that expose more and more of this terrible crime. At the same time, we see that the generosity by which the Dutch were showered after the war almost universally referred to as those who saved the Jews, is almost contrary to the way Lithuanians were and still are referred to. There is a suspicious aura created around the Lithuanians, and often conclusions are drawn that are the direct result of the idea that Lithuanians are still hiding the dark pages of their Holocaust-related past. A nice recent example is the suspicion created around the filmmaker Jonas Mekas, who was accused in 2018 by a young American researcher of not having been clear or straightforward about the question whether he had been a witness to the killing of two and a half thousand Jews in Birger in the early days of the war, and subsequently worked for two publications that were strongly anti-Semitic. Mikas did not write anything anti-Semitic himself, 
and might not have seen the mass grave, let alone the killing, but still he was considered guilty because he was there and was vague about his whereabouts. He was considered guilty by association, one could say, or rather, he was guilty of having been a bystander, the position in which usually 95% of the population finds itself. The researcher never asked himself the question whether this period might have been severely traumatic for a young man of 19 years of age, barely an adult, especially if he did witness the mass murder of the Jewish population in Birge. Because if that was the case, indeed the most natural method of surviving and remaining sane would be to forget to such an extent that the memory would indeed be gone as if it never happened. Yet the researcher sitting in his comfortable chair in his research institute seemed to be determined to find Mecca's guilty, even when there was nothing to prove. The German historian and politician Wolfgang Thierse once wrote about it in the DDR in which he lived and he worked. There are real perpetrators and real victims, guilty ones and innocent ones. And then in between there are many others, we who live there, busy getting by, more or less decent, more or less clever, more or less cowardly or brave. Indeed, the overwhelming part of the population in any country prefers to be compliant and not risk life or li livelihoods and looks the other way when life becomes too dangerous. The decision not to look the other way takes courage, yet fear is not a reason not to stop looking the other way. Just like Simeon Glusman, who decided to stay truthful to the ethics of his profession and speak up when he saw that his psychiatry was abused, even though fear and anxiety ran through his veins. In the same way, Andrei Sakharov decided to follow his conscience and speak up at the moment he saw that the hydrogen bomb he had helped to create was a horribly powerful weapon and he became one of the most influential campaigners for non-proliferation and arm reduction. They did what they thought was necessary to do, irrespective of the consequences. And so did the Dutch diplomat Jan Zwartendijk, who as an honorary consul of the Netherlands in Kaunas, handed out visas to Jews to help them escape a certain death. He too didn't consider himself to be a hero. He just did what he thought was the only right thing to do. And until a decade or so ago, his story was basically unknown to the outside world. He did what the Holocaust survivor Eli Wiesel once said, always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. But what is right is also a concept that changes with time. Looking back, it is always easy to say what was the right decision. But at the moment itself, it is often much less clear, and the only thing one can do is go by one's own moral compass. Yet that compass is also affected by the socio-political and cultural climate of that time. Between 1945 and 1949, the Dutch army fought a war in the Netherlands Indies against what they considered um, rebels. And they tried with all means to keep this part of the world Dutch, part of the kingdom of the Netherlands. My father was in his early 20s during the last year of the war and spent most of the war period hiding at home with a sign on the door, cholera, contagious, which prevented Nazis from entering the house and sending him off to Germany as a forced laborer. When a military operation started in the Dutch Indies, he registered himself as a volunteer, hoping to become a pilot, yet he was refused because of his eyesight. He was very upset because the possibility of finally taking part actively was denied. <coughs> the military operations in the Dutch Indies were quite ruthless, further stimulated by the dangerous surroundings, the impermeable jungle, and the ability of the enemy to hide and suddenly appear out of nowhere. The so-called police actions, during which many innocent civilians were killed and many freedom fighters were similarly executed, were then seen by most as fully justified and legendary figures like Raymond Westerveld, who through, t uh, through terror managed to subdue the uprising on the island of Celebes, were seen as heroes. However, according to the current standards and knowledge, he would have been considered a war criminal. 
Likewise, those who considered the police actions as war crimes in those days were often seen as traitors. Well, now the understanding is that they were perfectly right. The Dutch psychologist Joop Hutink, who as a military draftee witnessed summary executions during his time in the Dutch Indies, tried to have his story published in the 1950s, but no publication wanted to print it. When in 1968 he described the war crimes in his dissertation, he received countless threats. Attempts to establish a parliamentary commission to investigate the claims proved to be unsuccessful. Lithuania has its own disputed case, which time and again results in bitter discussions and political fights and still hasn't been resolved. What I'm referring to is the case of Noreika, whose plaque is still hanging on the facade of the Wroblewski Library of the Lithuanian Academy of Sciences. Or rather, it's again hanging there because in 2019, the plaque was demolished by a sledgehammer by an unknown protester, but then put back together, glued together, and put up on the wall, only to be removed by the mayor of Vilnius during the night. A few months later, a new plaque was put up, even bigger than the previous one, and so the case had again reached a stalemate. The issue with Noreika is that his life trajectory is one of victim and perpetrator at the same time. When the Second World started, Noreika ordered the establishment of the Jewish ghetto in Cholet and the expropriation of Jewish possessions. He subsequently became part of the anti-Nazi resistance, was as a result incarcerated in the Stutov concentration camp, and after the war joined the anti-Soviet resistance as General Storm, Generalis Vietra, was caught, sentenced to death, and executed. Victim and perpetrator. He is definitely not the only one. But because of having been instrumental in the Holocaust, his plaque should not be hanging on the wall in the streets of Vilnius, nor should there be a monument in his birthplace. Both actually belong in a museum where both stories are told, just like the National Military Museum in Soesterberg in the Netherlands bo tell both the stories of Raymond Westerveld and Joop Hutting. Noreika is a perfect kaleidoscope, you could say, to tell the complex story of Lithuania during the 1940s, in which people did heroic deeds, but also made terrible mistakes and wrong choices. These stories should be told, and a nation that wants to look truthful to the past and confident to the future should digest these issues rather than try to sweep them under the carpet. In my view, Major Simarchus made one mistake by removing the plaque at night, hoping to prevent a controversy. The controversy should not have been prevented, it should be carefully channeled, and the removal should have taken place in broad daylight, just like last year the body of Spanish dictator Francesco Franco was removed from his mausoleum in broad daylight and reburied in a family grave. These issues of moral conflict, shades of grey, and how people are able to commit mass murder or participate in torture, have kept me busy for the past two decades, and I continue to explore in the future hope that finding answers is a possibility to these questions. As Alexander Solzhenitsyn once wrote, the line that separates good and evil does not go through classes or groups, but right through every human heart. The line is movable, it fluctuates over the years. A bridgehead of good will remain even in a heart occupied by evil. And likewise, even in the most merciful heart, there will always be an impregnable hiding place for evil. A perfect example of this is the case of Eugene de Kock, a South African police colonel, who was so notorious as a torturer and assassin that he was named prime evil by the South African press. De Kock was involved in the guerrilla warfare against the anti-apartheid groups like ANC and SWAPO, he fought in what was then Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, as well as in Namibia and Angola, and eventually became head of the counterinsurgency unit of the South African police that kidnapped, tortured, and murdered numerous anti-apartheid activists from the 1980s to the early 1990s. He was also the head of the main torture center at Vlakplas and personally responsible for the torture and death of at least 100 anti-apartheid activists. Following South Africa's transition to democracy in 1994, 
the cock disclosed the full scope of his unit's crimes while testifying before the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. His testimony forced others to come forward too, as he decided to go clean and disclose, disclose everything that he knew, including who had been his supporters and who had been giving orders, naming even the president as having been responsible. In 1996, he was tried and convicted on 89 charges of murder and sentenced to 212 pr years in prison. After serving 20 years, he was paroled and continued helping the authorities to recover the remains of a number of his victims. De Kock was not the only person who showed remorse and altered his position fundamentally, but his case stands out because of the enormity of the crimes he committed, the pleasure that he seemed to have in making his victims suffer, and then this almost irreconcilable combination of pure evil with the manners of a gentleman, a soft voice and a belief in Christian values. He is an example of what the British historian Christopher Browning called ordinary men, the title of his book on one of the SS Einsatzgruppen that participated in the Holocaust, or the banality of evil that Hannah Arendt wrote about Eichmann while she watched this innocuous man in his glass cage during the trial in Jerusalem. Eichmann seemed just a pencil pusher, an image that he himself catered as much as possible. But what Arendt actually did not know, and the court did, was that Eichmann had been interviewed by the Dutch SS officer Willem van Sassen during his time in Argentina, and that the interview showed him being a rabid anti-Semite who was only sorry that he killed only 6 million Jews and not all 10 million Jews on the European continent. The court, however, could not use the interviews because they only had a transcript and therefore could not prove that these were his exact words. Indeed, every person has a dark side. The question is, however, by what it is triggered and what makes it become so overbearing and violent. The British psychologist Simon Baron Cohen wrote a fantastic book on the subject in which he argued which genetic and which social factors play a role in becoming evil. In his book titled The Science of Evil, Baron Cohen explains that there is no scientific value in the term evil, but that there is a scientific value in using the term empathy erosion. The key claim in his book is that, and he writes, that when people commit acts of cruelty, a, spe a specific circuit in the brain, the empathy circuit, goes down. This might be temporarily, for example, when we are stressed, or in a more enduring way. And for some people, this empathy circuit never developed in the first place for reasons of, of iron, 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 environmental neglect and or for genetic reasons. He then continues by asserting the functionality of the empathy circuit, how that determines how much empathy a person has, from zero degrees at the low and to, to six degrees at the high end. Most people are somewhere in the middle, but some people have zero degrees or empath of empathy, or even zero negative, which may be caused by medical psychiatric conditions, such as a personality disorder, like psychopaths or people with borderline personality disorder. We usually tend to think that those who commit mass murder are not only bad, but also mad. But the truth is actually quite opposite. In fact, as Christopher Browning pointed out in his book, Ordinary Men, most of them were actually quite normal. Even the 22 na Nazi leaders who were put on trial in Nuremberg were not mentally ill, including Rudolf Hess, who had flown to Scotland in 1941 to try to broker a peace agreement with the United Kingdom and unsuccessfully pretended to be suffering from amnesia. Actually, these 22 Nazi leaders on trial were quite intelligent, with IQs ranging, fro uh, ra ranging from 122 to 148. Those who carried out the killings were neither psychopaths, which is quite logical because what commanders needed were people to follow orders, not psychopaths who tend to go berserk and are completely uncontrollable. Because of COVID-19, this public lecture is online, and I'm standing here in a completely empty hall and don't even know how many people are watching my presentation. It evokes very unsettling emotions, and in spite of the fact that we are already more than a year in this situation, it is still very difficult to accept. 
COVID-19 is a massive life-changing event that has shaken the foundations of our societies, has resulted in heightened levels of stress, anxiety, depression, has challenged our authorities, and also shown that in times of deep crisis, presumed solidarity and unity is very fragile, actually, and severely challenged. Within an amazingly short period of time, countries close their borders and block foreigners from crossing their borders. The pandemic also highlighted the omnipresent tension between personal freedom and social responsibility. This tension between the two is an eternal one and should, in fact, eternally be debated. Because it's not only your freedom to choose to become infected or not, but it's also your social responsibility not to infect others. Likewise, it's your personal freedom to look the other way when people are unjustly arrested, deported or killed. But it is, in my view, your social responsibility to speak out, even if this means endangering your own livelihood. But again, I know this is easily said. When I was a courier to the dissident movement in the Soviet Union, I had no children, and in particular, my mother supported what I did. If I had children, I might not have done the same. Or at least I would have been probably more careful and stopped traveling when all the indicators were that I had a very good chance of being arrested and used for a show trial. So when in the winter of 2013-14, I was at Maidan in Kiev, and things turned violent, I had to take the conscious decision to stay even if I would risk my health or my life. My children were grown up, and my sense of social responsibility was stronger than my anxieties and fears. In conclusion, I applaud the bravery of many Belarusian citizens who have understood that unless they take their respons uh, social responsibility and by doing so endanger their personal freedom, nothing will ever change. As Alexander Solzhenitsyn put it in 1974 in his essay, essay, Live Not By Lies, let each of us make a choice, whether consciously to remain a servant of falsehood or to shrug off the lies and become an honest man worthy of respect, both by one's children and contemporaries. It will not be an easy choice for a body, but it's the only one for the soul. It's not an easy path, but there are already people, even dozens of them, who over the years have maintained all these points and live by the truth. Thank you. So there are a number of questions that were put um, online um, and several that were coming from uh, students of mine. So the first one is, Andrei Sakharov was a man who by his example decidedly inspired generations for the struggle for freedom and human rights and set the course for many organizations in the field. What were the key characteristics of Andrei Sakharov's person that inspired you personally and might be attractive to younger generations in the future. And then the second is also related to Sakharov, how influential he actually was outside uh, his own region in the West, and what were the key elements that made him an international figure? Was he only a useful tool for the West, or was he something more? And whether it is all possible to reach this level of moral leadership in the contemporary context at all? I think what is... Um, key to the person of Andrei Sakharov is that he remained himself. He did not create a fake image of himself. Uh, yes, he was a brilliant scientist, but he did not place himself above others. He was an ordinary person with an enormous intellect, but also with a very strong moral compass. And uh, even being, you know, a member of the uh, high nomenclatura in the, in the Soviet Union, you know, a member of the Academy of Science at the age of 32, direct contact to the political leadership, for him this was not a reason to remain silent and um, not to do what he did. And there is this one uh, very uh, well-known uh, situation when he is in the Congress of People's Deputies, where he was a member, where he... Uh, actually says that, you know, I was banished to Gorky for seven years because I spoke out against the war in Afghanistan. 
a criminal war, as he repeatedly says. And he sees it as a medal, a badge of honor that he was sent to Gorky for uh, speaking out. I think the, 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 the saddest thing with Andrei Dmitrich is the fact that uh, he died too early. Um, at the time when he died, he was internationally very well known. He was seen at exactly the same level as uh, uh, Nelson Mandela. Um, not for nothing, the European Parliament uh, decided to name its Human Rights Prize after Andrei Sakharov. In the Netherlands, there are two bridges over the Rhine at Arnhem. One is the Mandela Bridge, the other is the, uh, the Sakharov Bridge. And so Mandela had a chance of becoming free and becoming the first uh, black president of South Africa and inspiring this change in society. Um, Sakharov died uh, too early. Uh, if he would have lived longer, he might have played a similar role as uh, Václav Havel in, uh, in Czechoslovakia, later in the Czech Republic. And so the sad thing is that because of all the turmoil of the late 80s and the beginning of the 90s, Sakharov kind of faded away into, uh, you know, out of public uh, space. And I think this is one of the main issues that we are trying to do at the Andrei Sakharov Center in, uh, in Kaunas, that is to bring him back. Uh, in the public domain and to show him as an example of a person who followed his mor moral compass instead of looking at his benefits and his luxury uh, position. Then there is um, a question. Almost entire, uh, your entire life you spent defending human rights or helping those you defended. How would you argue the need to continue this fight in the contemporary context in our materialistic culture and surplus of information? How to explain the importance of human rights to regular people in the pandemic world when most of the people are more preoccupied with personal issues uh, rather than, you know, uh, human rights? Well, you know, I don't think that in my time it was different. Um, of course, as I now understand, the, uh, the story of my uncles uh, had an influence. Uh, so as one uh, uh, friend, a psychiatrist, once told me, uh, we are uh, war children. Um, our whole life is kind of infused with war-related issues. Um, but, you know, also in my time, um, uh, you know, the younger generation was having a good time. We had flower power. You know, I was educated in a school which was a little bit late. So um, we were smoking weed um, even during classes. Uh, I remember one of my uh, fellow students was smoking weed uh, because he was studying Chinese and weed helped him very much to, you know, to, uh, to uh, pass his exams. Um, but that doesn't mean that you do not have a choice, that you do not have a responsibility. And the, the, the thing is that like here in Lithuania, yes, we have a democratic society. Uh, the Soviet past is not yet completely gone. Uh, definitely not, but we have a free democratic society. But if you want to keep it free, uh, you need to do something. It's not like sitting back in your chair and uh, thinking that, uh, you know, it will all go by itself. Unless we keep fighting, um, we cannot keep what we have right now. Then there is a question. You talked about different types of empathy, sometimes witnessing these differences firsthand, like different mental health strategies, could you elaborate what nations differ in this regard? What are the key things that help to develop these futures? You mentioned cases of reputation washing uh, in different narratives, but probably it goes deeper than that. Having studied various contexts, what would you say could help improve the level of empathy in society? I think um, in a democratic, parliamentary, uh, you know, parla parliamentary democracy uh, and a state based on the rule of law, empathy comes easier um, because it doesn't, the consequences are not the same than if you grow up in a, uh, you know, in a uh, dictatorial environment or a repressive environment. But at the same time, the, the need, the urgency of checking your personal uh, um, moral compass and making decisions is not as strong as in a dictatorial country. And the harshness of a regime 
is maybe a stimulus that helps people to speak out. It is also a stimulus for culture and for art, actually. You know, like in the Soviet Union, uh, you had some fantastic bards uh, singing songs that were basically ch channeling all the thoughts that the population had but didn't dare to speak out because of the, the consequences. So you had people like Bulut Okujava, like uh, Vladimir Vysotsky, like uh, Yuli Kim, and uh, you can wonder whether they would have reached this level of, uh, you know, uh, importance and, um, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, being well known if they had grown up in a uh, democratic society. Um, what people tend to forget is that a person like Vladimir Vysotsky, who died at a very young age, had his funeral just before the Olympic Games in Moscow, and in spite of all the attempts of the Soviet authorities to kind of whisk him away, uh, some 40,000 people came out to bury uh, Vladimir Vysotsky, which in Soviet times was completely unheard of. So, you know, I think um, there are factors that stimulate um, uh, empathy, um, but these factors also actually exist in, uh, in uh, your envi uh, environment. And I think upbringing is a, is a very important issue in this. The, the, the message that you get from your parents, uh, the way you are taught to think about others, uh, not about yourself. And I think the book by Simon Baron Cohen, it's a very interesting because his first part is explaining that, you know, it's all in genes and it's all predetermined, and so there's nothing you can do about it. If you're bad, you're bad. And by the time you think that, you know, now you go too far because it's not that easy, then he starts climbing down again and starting to explain that there are many social factors that determine whether this genetic predisposition is triggered or not. Then there is a question. In your speech, you mentioned that the writings of Alexander Zozhenitsyn had a profound impact on captivating you and shaping your understanding of the plight of political prisoners in the Soviet Union. But it was your personal relationship with the late Vladimir Bukowski that played the definite role in your decision to become fully involved in the dissident movement. One of the intended objectives of the Sakharov Research Center in Kaunas is to help revive the spirit of Andrei Sakharov and use his moral standing as a guiding example. Um, a, a guiding example and a call for action for all of us to take our re social responsibility seriously, much like Mr. Bukowski did in your youth. In your opinion, can people be inspired in this way by a figure whose words and struggles may seem far removed from the contemporary realities? Yes, I think we all need examples in our life. Um, for some of, uh, uh, for some of it, uh, us, it is... Um, members of the family. Um, for others, it's outsiders. I think, um, yeah, meeting Bukowski was for me a life changer, fundamental life changer, uh, because, uh, yeah, he was older than me, uh, um, about 15 years, I think, um, maybe 20. But he was, you know, his whole youth had been spent in camps and prisons and psychiatric hospitals, so he was, in a way, um, very much of my own age, right, as far as his um, way of behavior. I uh, remember, it's one of the funny stories with him, so the first time I met him and stayed with him uh, in, uh, as, a, as a guest was when he was living in London at uh, 60 Chalk Farm Road, and he was living in a building where on the ground floor was a Greek restaurant. And this Greek restaurant, um, you know, closed at midnight, but then would continue in the cellar uh, for, you know, the favorite guests. Uh, so they knew that you had to stick around till 12 and then the doors would go closed and then everybody go in the cellar. And then the party would continue till four o'clock in the morning. So we were there many, many times. Um, Bukowski had was then very wealthy because his book had come out, was a bestseller all across the world. So the first thing he did was buy a house for his mother, who had uh, also emigrated, and then his own house. And so he had a lot of money to spend. And so one of the habits in this Greek restaurant was uh, to throw the plates against the wall. 
right? It's um, a Greek habit which the uh, colonel's regime in Greece tried to, you know, um, kind of stop, but uh, never managed. And so uh, Bukowski was ordering one plate, uh, one starter plate after the other. Uh, prosciutto in Milona was his favorite, and would then put the Milona and the prosciutto aside and throw it through the restaurant against the wall. And he, you know, he was on and on into this, and he, for him it was, you know, the biggest pleasure. He was, you know, after 12 years of camp and prison, um, this was um, uh, one of the things that really made him feel free. And I think for me that was very important that he, that we had this connection, that it almost like an age-like connection. Although at the same time he was a kind of godfather for me, um, pushing me in the direction in which I am right now. But I think uh, Gluzman is in that sense even more important because Gluzman, being the philosopher, helped me change this black-white view into one of shades of gray and trying to understand the other side. Because I think um, it's very easy to just push people away and say, well, you're bad, you're evil, uh, you're on the wrong side. But it's trying to understand why people are there, why they make their choices, uh, what is the person behind it is, I think, essential also as a kind of mirror for yourself because it also helps you to think about yourself. And so Sakharov, you know, uh, I remember for us, we never talked about Sakharov. We always talked about Andrei Dmitrich. When you talk about Andrei Dmitrich, we all knew whom you were talking about. And for us, he was, um, I think, the best example of a person for whom his morality and his um, being able to look to himself in the mirror was much more important than anything else. All the luxury uh, medals, et cetera, et cetera. Being able to look your, to at yourself in the mirror is in that sense very important. In your personal, last question, in your personal life, was your, it was your parents that instilled you with the moral values that allowed you later in your life to follow your conscience and to do what had to be done irrespective of the consequences. In this way, your decision was easy. But what would you say to those who weren't so fortunate and never received this guidance and rather were left to shape their moral compasses on their own accord and in the age dominated by information technologies that give way to illegitimate and at times nefarious actors to disseminate dangerous falsehood that can degrade the social fabrics of society. Again, um, you know, my mother was, um, how to put it, uh, pathologically honest. And yes, she instilled in me much against my opposition, inner opposition, these basic Christian values. Um, I was a impossible kid. Um, I think at the age of 13, she kind of gave up uh, trying to educate me. My father, his kind of favorite sentence was, uh, you don't educate your children, you try to survive them. Um, but somehow these constant drips of information and ideas um, helped shape me. But at the same time, there was a, you know, there was a, uh, a, a ground for this. Uh, it, it was not on a barren soul. So I think uh, every person can have a example, can follow an example. It can be in your environment, it can be far away, it can be from a book. I think one of the things that we try to do at the Andrei Sakharov Research Center in uh, Kaunas is to offer the possibility of, you know, accepting our information, listening to us, and use that in making decisions in life. And I'm always very happy when, after a course, um, there are students that kind of pop out and they come to us and say, well, can we be an intern with you, or can we do this, or can we do that? And I can see it in the research papers that they write. And so I see it as my task to try to help people make choices in life and hopefully, you know, choices that are not only good for them, but also good for the, uh, for the rest of society. Um, and I think this is one of the horrors of COVID that um, I now have class where it's all kind of one dimensional. Um, 
you see faces, if you see faces, because a lot of students don't turn on their, their microphone or their, their camera, and I don't even know whether they are there. I sometimes test by saying, uh, well, Biruta, what do you think? And then there is no answer, so you understand that Biruta is probably, I don't know, doing the dishes or something else. Um, but I miss this connection with my students, and I very much hope that after the summer this will be quite different. And so, you know, um, this is for me being here and working here and teaching and engaging with young people is for me probably the the best part of my life. You know, it's uh, the feeling that I really am able to do something that is beneficial to society and to individual people. I think that's it. Uh, no more questions. Thank you for listening. Uh, this will be uh, recorded. It is recorded. It will be, uh, you know, uh, a file that will be put on the website and so people can watch it later as well. Thank you.